The Things We All Carry is a podcast about first responders and their stories surrounding trauma on the job. The intention of this podcast is to raise awareness and share meaningful conversation around a subject often viewed as taboo or simply ignored. Be aware this content may be graphic and it is real. It may not be suitable for children or adults triggered by this subject matter. Welcome to episode 87 of The Things We All Carry. Today's introduction is going to be a little different. Normally I sit down and I write out what I want to say and whether things to say about today's guest, and I don't want to steal from the importance of the guest. Um, today's a different kind of day for me. I am in Pennsylvania and I'm having to face the very imminent death of my mom. So I'm a little distracted, excuse me. I'm a little distracted from the norm. So bear with me. And, uh, Maybe I, just let me ramble for a minute here. Death is a weird thing. That's an obvious statement. We all deal with it differently. I've known for years. I, well, I mean, come on, seriously, we all know we're going to die eventually. You just don't know when. But I've known for years that my mom's death was imminent. Uh, she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. A few years ago, kind of, before the beginning of the pandemic and she's dealt with it with grace and dignity. She's been in hospice since January. Um, and you think of hospice, you think, Oh, they only have a a couple of weeks, weeks to go or whatever. Um, and this woman, this amazing woman has, has been there for 10 months and she's refused to, to give in. And to this day, I, I don't know what's held her and what's kept her refusing to give in but something's there and I don't know. None of us know how to deal with death and I'm trying to, I'm not trying, I'm struggling with how to deal with her death for the majority of my life. She's been a single mother and I gave her hell. I I gave her hell. I was a, I was, I was a tough kid to raise and she stood toe to toe with me through all of it. She's been my biggest, my biggest supporter through, through a life. She's been the one person that never hesitated to tell me the truth, whether it hurt or whether it helped or whatever, it always helped, but she was always the one person that never hesitated to, to try and put me in my place. Um, I'm struggling with, with trying to figure out how to, how to accept it and how to move forward. So while death is imminent for all of us and you will be touched by death in some manner, especially us in the first responder world, firefighter, cop, military, doctors, nurses, whatever it is, we're touched with death on a daily basis pretty much. Uh, Death is a very different thing when it's personal. Uh, When it's a family member and you have to you watch a family member suffer and you watch family members taking care of, of someone who's suffering. It is uh it's a different experience and it's one that I, I, nobody wants to go through, but everybody will probably go through at some point in their life. And I can only hope that when my time comes, I can only hope that when my time comes, I go through it with the attitude and the love and the grace that she has. I've seen her crack exactly two times through this journey. And once was at the beginning when she learned that she had cancer. And once was the other day. Physical pain is one thing. You expect physical pain with something like cancer. It's the emotional pain in it. And it's that acceptance or that realization that things aren't going well or things are ending. And when you see that in their face or you see, hear it in their words, that's what hurts the most. This journey for her has been a long one. It's been a tough one. She's been a champ throughout. I don't want her to die. But I don't want her to suffer. And for someone who I think and I believe 
is one of the best human beings in, in the entire world. To suffer is a heart that's tough to accept. And I want to rage. But I just want to celebrate our life as well. And at some point, I have to, I have to bring it all together, mix it all together, and juxtapose all these emotions and all these feelings and work it out in my head and work it out in my heart. And honor her and love her. And, uh, and find that way to say goodbye. You know, that way to, that way to say goodbye that she realizes she did all she could for me, for my sisters, for her friends, that she lived a, a full life and she was loved till the day she died. And I hope to, to celebrate that, to celebrate her life, to celebrate her love, to celebrate everything she's done for me. And I can, I can only hope that when it's my time to go, someone feels The people think the same of me. And I'm a, I'm a, a much more flawed individual. I'm a much more flawed human than she, she could ever imagine being. But she's the reason I never went off the rails completely, believe it or not. She's the reason that I, I've made it to who I am and what I am in, in this life. I owe her everything. All the successes are, are due to her. All the flaws are mine. So if you got some time today, call a loved one. Call your mom. Call your dad. And uh, just let them know what you think. Tell me you love them. Or if they're close by, wrap them in a hug. And wrap them in a hug and let them know. With that being said, welcome to episode 87 of The Things We All Carry. Today's guest is Charlie Collins. Charlie is a, a singer-songwriter out of Northern Virginia who also happens to be a firefighter. He's a firefighter in Loudoun County. He's, uh, he spent time in the Air National Guard. He picked up the guitar recently as a, as a way to, to recover and, and, and uh, as a piece of therapy, actually. And from there, between TikTok and YouTube and friends and, and coworkers, his stuff got out on the, on the internet and he was picked up by a producer in Nashville. Uh, actually, uh, the son of Roger Miller. And some of you might know who Roger Miller is. He, uh, he's famous for the, the song King of the Road. Uh, his son, his son found Charlie and decided he was worth recording. And, and I, I had to agree with him. So the result of that recording was the EP called Undisclosed. And you're going to hear some of the songs from that in today's episode. And you're going to hear a couple of unreleased songs and, uh, this one was a good one. This was a, this was a fun one to do. There, there was a typical story of life and, and some traumas and some, some drama and then recovery. But there's also, uh, like I said, there are five songs mixed in. And it was a little tricky for me because it's the first time I've recorded music along with, with a podcast. So hopefully the quality treats you right and, and you enjoy this show as much as I did. A quick reminder, though, please... Help us build a community which not only recognizes but supports each other through the struggles and recovery. Reach out through Instagram at the things we all carry or email my story at the things we all carry dot com to offer support and share your story. Please remember to leave a review on iTunes and give a shout out to any first responder you know, love, or care about. Y'all enjoy this show. Bucks like me, bet your daddy's so proud. It's 
Back to the things we all carry today. I'm uh, I'm honored to have somebody with me, actually in person, talking and recording, and actually going to play some music for us. So, uh, Charlie Collins, thanks for coming on. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. This is uh, this is cool for me to get to uh, kind of talk about other stuff besides music. You know. So for you, those of you guys that don't know, Char- Charlie Collins is a firefighter with Loudoun County, Virginia, and he's also a singer songwriter who's just starting to make a make a splash on actually, I guess, the national scene, right, Charlie? Yeah, uh, yeah, mo- I, I, it's so weird. National is such a broad term. It feels like East Coast, like East Coast scene, if, right. if that's the thing. But yeah, man, it's uh, spreading the wings and then trying to move away from home a little bit with it. But So you fun. just got back from a, from a radio tour. Yeah, so I did a uh, radio tour. We moved around um, a, a couple of places, East Coast and Ohio, and uh, uh, just did some like simple like local home station radio interviews and stuff, trying to spread the word about uh, my music and trying to put some, some plants in different areas of the country. And, uh, then on top of that, it was the same, pretty much the same month I was finishing like an actual music tour. So we were just, I feel like I was going like a thousand miles a minute and now I've just slowed down. And I'm like the last four or five days I've had like nothing to do. And I'm like, well, is it a shock to the body? It's, it's the best shock to the body. Ever. <laughs> like, yeah, getting to sleep in like, my body still wakes up at like eight and I'm like, oh God, this is the best feeling ever. So yeah, I would, that'd be awesome actually for any of us. Some of us can't even sleep past six 30 anymore, six in the morning. So yeah. that's that eight would be great. Yeah. And so how long you been with Loudoun County? Uh, I've been with Loudoun for a little over four years. So I got hired there. I got hired in 2019 and then, uh, you know, with the Academy and all that stuff mixed in, whether you want to count that as time served or not, you know? Yeah. It's all, it's time served. Yeah. That's what I, that's how I see it. And so how are you balancing, and we're going to get, we get a more depth into your story, but how are you balancing music and fire now? Uh, precariously. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it kind of like, I feel like in the guys on shift, it's going to be probably seen it where music went from like something that was kind of fun to like something that, oh shit, like there might be something to this. And so I kind of had to reel back sometimes in music you know, to make sure that my head stays right for, for the fire department. So it's kind of this back and forth fluctuation for a short period until it's like when I'm at work, I'm at work, you know, music shit isn't what I'm here for. And then, you know, outside of that, if I've got other stuff going on, when I get off the clock, like I'm off the clock. Um, so it's definitely, definitely a, uh, like a, a, a fine mix of things, but, um, I think I've got it pretty hammered out right now and, uh, it's busy. And it adds to the the sleep deprivation that, you know, we're all kind of privy to anyway sometimes. But I don't know. It's worth it. It's one of those things you just love and, and you do it and it's worth it. So let me give a, a we'll give a shout out to Matt real quick because Matt was one of my guests oh, early yeah. on. And, and he's the one that, that turned me on to your music. And so big shout out to and a thanks to Matt Hartman for uh, putting me on to you and your music. Um, and this is going to be a kind of a silly question. It, maybe not because I'd like to hear it. I, I've been asking people, what's the last song you've listened to? The last song I listened to, uh, that's such a weird question because I was in the truck listening to the most obscure, like, I, I listen to so much, like, certain artists that I'll be in the truck and, like, every now and then I'll get a wild hair and I'll just listen to people I don't even know, never heard of. Right. So, to be quite honest with you, I don't remember the artist's name. It was from an album called Steel Cuts and uh, kind of like some low-end country guy. It was actually pretty cool, but I can't remember his name. But yeah, super random that you asked me that today. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons that Matt's, you know, kind of turned me on to you is because music is a huge part of my life. I love just listening to music, going to concerts, whatever. And so I just like to get ideas for new music. That's why that's yeah. why I asked that question. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where'd you grow up? Yeah. So uh, I actually grew up in Percival, Virginia, which isn't too far uh, from Loudoun County. I mean, it's in Loudoun County. So it's not like I, you know, picked up and moved super far to get this job, but I did leave as soon as I graduated high school. I enlisted in the Air Guard up in West Virginia and uh, went up there. And that was kind of like the start of my like adulthood life. And it started real fast. Um, I was going to schools with a, you know, found a girl that I, I was with and whatever. She ends up getting pregnant and I end up having a son. I end up marrying this girl uh, later down the road. But um, yeah, so it was like that implantment of moving to West Virginia and going from the Loudoun County bubble, as I call it, to real life 
was a was a hell of a jump, man. But uh, yeah, it led to a lot of good things. It led to some bad things. But uh, you know, it just kind of builds builds me into who I am, and I'm sure everyone can kind of relate to that in a sense. It's funny that you call it the Loudoun County bubble because it is a, it is a bubble out there, and it, it, it's a it's a bubble unto itself from from Virginia, from Northern Virginia, from yeah. West Virginia. It's just 100%. it's just nestled in there, and it's completely different from other things around it. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, it borders West Virginia, and I think in my entire childhood growing up, I don't think I went into West Virginia maybe like twice for fireworks with my dad it, to yeah. get all the good illegal yep, shit to get the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, what was growing up like? Peaceful growing up, or is it was it an easy childhood? Was it, what is it for you? I feel like in hindsight, man, it's hard to complain. Like I had a great childhood. Um, you know, parents divorced when I was like uh, three or four, somewhere around there. But uh, I felt like I was kind of at this like uh, looking back. I feel like my age group and like the people in my generation, like that became such a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Whether that's good or bad is, is indifferent. But like. It didn't feel like the world was crumbling, you know, it was like, oh, well, you know, Ryan, you know, his parents are getting divorced. And so it didn't feel like you were like the only one stuck out with that. So it's hard to say that that really caused any issues. So, I mean, man, I had a great life. I feel like really sheltered, not so much in the sense of like my parents made me do certain things at certain days of the week or whatever, just in the sense of that Loudoun County bubble, man, like you lose sense of reality. And if you're a kid, you never have it. So like not knowing the dangers that are out in the world and how like a small decision could affect you like financially or, you know, uh, with your friends or whatever, like those things you're so out of touch with growing up here, which is, I guess, good and bad at the same time. So yeah, great, great childhood, man. And, and, um, uh, you know, I'm glad to have that bubble popped when I graduated high school and do some things the hard way, put me in a, in a good spot that I like to be in. So you go to West Virginia to join the Air National Guard. Why? Uh, uh you know, it's kind of funny. I, uh, I, I feel like there was this nagging at me as a kid in high school where like, I didn't fit in well. Um, not in a bad way. I just, I didn't feel like I fit in with everyone else. And I was like, man, I just want to leave. Like I want to do something. I want to do something that I can be proud of. And I was like, I'm going to be a Marine. Cause that's like, you know, the Marine recruiters come walking around the school in their class A's and, and you're like, oh yeah, like that's what I'm going to do. So I came home and I told my dad, I was like, dad, I'm going to be a Marine. My dad's like, fuck no, <laughs> absolutely not. And uh, he just desperately went on this bender to find anything other than that. And one of his options was the Air National Guard. He's a he's a pilot. And so some of his friends worked in the Air National Guard. And he's like, well, let's, he's like, let's just take a trip up here. You know, if you don't like it, we could talk about something else. But before you enlist, you have to do this. And I was like, fine. So I did. And uh yeah, man, it's a super small base, and uh, but it was so cool, man. The the jets out there, never having walked through a a cargo jet or a military aircraft at all, I was like, oh, this is kind of fucking cool, you know. And talking to the recruiter, the recruiter makes it sound real nice, and they're all genuinely good people up there. So I was like, man, this is kind of cool. And like, oh, I can. They'll pay for me to go to WVU. I'm like, I can go to WVU. <laughs> And be in the military, and they're gonna pay for that. I was like, oh, sorry, that's a pretty good deal. Pay me to go to a party school. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, so you went to WVU? I did not. Okay, so <laughs> never mind. Where the story deviated. This was the grand plan: was to go to WVU, have Uncle Sam pay for it, have this great four years. And uh, yeah, I uh, I uh, decided after I started working there, I was like, you know, I met this girl, and uh, you know, some other things. I was like, I don't know if I want to go to WVU, and so I went to Shepherd University. Not for very long. Went for like a year. And uh, just, man, college is one of those things. It wasn't for me. Yeah. And one of those bittersweet moments of when you're 19 and you find out you're having a kid, you're like, shit, what the hell am I going to do with my life? Yeah. And uh, I was like, well, I was like, the college thing ain't working out real well. Like, I don't like it. And I was like, I have this job in the Air Guard. I was like, I'll move there full time. And then I decided, you know, I don't want to be a mechanic. I was working as a mechanic out there on the jets. And I was like, I, I don't know if I want to do this full time. And, uh, my, now my ex, but at the time my girlfriend was like, Hey, you know, there's a, a fire department spot open on base. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I applied to be a cop like everywhere. Cause I didn't know any better. I was like, oh, I'm going to do something that matters. And, uh, yeah. So I went up to the fire department, took this test and I was like, man, these guys are kind of badass, dude. Like, you know, the, they're all tight knit. Like, this is what I want to do. And, uh, I got the job and like, man, I can't tell you how fast I fell in love with the job. Um, it was crazy. It was such a blessing in disguise and it never would have happened if all those bad things in life for me, you know, that, that I, at the time I thought were bad never happened. So 
what a blessing that sometimes you just think you're in this pit and things are just not looking good for you. But damn, dude, like how misunderstanding I was of those emotions was uh, was crazy. Well, what's the process on base to apply to be a firefighter? So uh, is it, is it a federal now. job? So it's not a federal job okay. right now. And that's like the biggest, the biggest catch 22 is you're like, man, it's all super sweet. And like, if it was a federal job, they would have people beating down the doors to right. get in there. Um, they're actually kind of fighting that right now, but they're actually uh, state firefighters that have a requirement, uh, I believe through the Air National Guard base, through the Air Force, if you will. Um, and I could be wrong in, in how this is set up, but I do know for a fact it's called dual status. So whoever it's set up with, they're state firemen, but they're required to have to be in the military to, uh, to have that job. So you can apply as a civilian. Anybody can apply. If you get the job, it's mandated. You have to go through boot camp. You have to go through the DOD Fire Academy where all uh, military firemen go through. And then uh, during the week, you're actually in a state uniform, X, Y, and Z. But on drill weekends, you have to put the uniform on, abide by military uh, you know, standards, customs, and courtesies, things of that nature. So um, that's, that's the only downfall to that place is uh, that they lose a lot of people because of that. You get these great certs. The military pays for all these cool certs. And then you look at the state's a uh, paycheck and you're like, oh, well, you know, Loudoun County or, or Prince William, literally anybody in Northern Virginia, DC, whoever, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this much more money and they're just going to let me basically walk on as a lateral transfer. You know, it's almost a no brainer. So uh, nothing but love for that place, man. I, I love those fucking guys out there. And, uh, you know, I hope that, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, it gets figured out. So, so they're not getting the one, they're not the ones who are taking punishment because that place Builds fucking some serious firemen, man. Anybody that applies uh, to any of these counties or jurisdictions that have applicants from the West Virginia Air National Guard, those dudes are some serious firemen. So that was 2017, correct? Yeah. You hired as, as a firefighter in the Air Guard. Yeah. What was your What was your main job in, in the Air Guard? Was it firefighting or was it something else? So after I transferred in 2017, I enlisted in 2015 and ah, I was a, gotcha. a fuel systems mechanic. So basically we climbed inside of all the fuel tanks. Uh, in this case, it was C-17s, uh, which is like a big cargo aircraft. So the fuel tanks are in the wings. Um, so there's these little holes you jump through. But I did that for a couple of years. And then, uh, yeah, you know, finding out I was having a kid, I was like, is this what I want to, you know, is this what I want to do? And I was like, no, it's not. Yeah. So it's a great job. It just was a lot of paperwork. And anybody who knows me knows I'm god awful with paperwork. So. All right. So 2017 hired Air National Guard firefighter. 2015 is when you got into the Air Guard. And then 2019 ish, you said Loudoun yep. County. All right. So where, where did, where did your deployment come in? Uh, so in I there? got deployed in 2021. Okay. So you're already in Loudoun recent. County. Yeah. With, okay. All right. Yeah. So I was off my rookie book. I'd been, been like one of the guys in the station for, for a little while. And uh, you know, the deployment, we knew it was coming down the line. So everybody knew what was going to happen. Uh, right before the deployment was the divorce for me, uh, time frame wise, like 2020. Um, so, you know, kind of dealing with that mess and, and trying to trying to figure out my personal self again. And that's kind of when music came into play, too, um, was like right at right at the divorce line was like therapist telling me to do something that I enjoyed. And I was like, well, I had this guitar when I was in high school and I learned how to play like wagon wheel to like try and get girls and that fucking failed miserably, but <laughs> I kind of enjoyed wagon wheel. So, um, you know, she was like, I would try music again. So I did. And I think like the day before deployment, uh, you know, they tell you, you can have this many bags because we have our fire gear that we got to take. So we have a bunch of shit and they're like, Oh, you can take like, you know, if you have this amount of work stuff, you can have like two personal bags you can take with you. I was like, all right. So I packed all my shit into one. I was like, I don't need the second one. And my dad's like, you should bring your guitar. I was like, I might get my, my throat slit if I bring a guitar. Like, these guys might kill me. And uh, he's like, you should fucking do it anyway. And so I, I did. And I got a little, you know, made fun of walking up to the fire department the morning of deployment, you know, with my guitar in hand. Everyone's like, oh, fuck. Like, we're going to have to listen to this shit for fucking six months. And, um, yeah, I'm glad I did, man. Uh, overseas, it was like find a little nook out there and, and kind of play to myself and write some stuff. And a couple guys heard it and, and enjoyed it. And, you know, next thing you know, like every Friday night, if we weren't working over there, our work schedule was 24 on, 24 off the whole time. So if it's a, you know, a Friday night and we're off work, like we have a little bonfire, get together and uh, just kind of turn into like these like really homey feeling like 
not concerts, but just like just sing-alongs, man. Right. It was like, hey, play this. And I was like, all right, I'll figure it out. And, you know, we'd muscle through it or whatever. And next thing I know, everyone knows like every word to all these songs that I wrote and, you know, led to videos going out. And, you know, I started getting hit up by producers and people wanting to buy songs and stuff. And it led to a deal in Nashville that I did. And that's where that first album came from. So, so. I want to ask you one one thing about because you said the therapist suggested music as a, as an outlet. Yeah. So, it, well, why did you why did you seek therapy at that time though? So the divorce, um, you know, was really messy, and it wasn't like messy, like bloody, like we're going at each other's throats. But it was like, as a nineteen year old, when you have a kid, for me at least, for for my nineteen year old self, like I told myself, I got this, you know, I got this, and everything, like all the little things. And I moved to West Virginia and, and, you know, I didn't really have a lot of contact with my family. It's not like my family didn't want to be involved, but I was kind of stubborn and like, I'll do it on my mm -hmm. own. You know, I can do this. So I didn't have friends. I was brand new out there. I was a, a rookie at the firehouse and uh, like, you know, nobody wants to go hang out with the rookie, especially up there at the time and whatever. So it was, uh, it was a lot of like, I'll do it myself, I'll do it myself, I'll do it myself. And that just led to if a bad decision was made instead of owning up and dealing with it head on, I was like, I just, you know, forget it. We'll, you know, we'll do something else. And, you know, it met, led to a lot of bad decisions on on my part and her part. And, you know, um, the divorce was happening. And that's where it just started to get all those bad decisions that like stacked up, started just shining through. And then it kind of caused this, uh, I can do it, I can do it to fuck it, dude, I'm done you know, and like everything just started piling on and it was like all hope was lost type mentality. I was like, whatever, like nothing matters. Not like depressing, right? but um, in a sense of just like, eh, you know, whatever, like I've lost, I'm getting divorced. I'm, I've lost, you know, the game's over for me. Right. So, uh, you know, we started going through couples therapy and that kind of turned into, you know, not necessarily working, but I kind of stuck with it. And, uh, you know, that lady pretty much like saved my life and, and led me into music too, which is a huge part of my life now. So yeah, it was a, it was the best therapeutic outlet is what it started for. And, and I still, it's still that for me. So what would you consider your first song you, that you wrote as, as therapy for you? Um, probably nothing at all, which I actually cut on the e, the Nashville EP. Um, yeah, that song was like the most like uh, angst, depressing, filled, like therapeutic outlet of a song for me. Um, and it just kind of got out all the things that I felt, um, at the time. And, and, you know, I can, it's one of those things where I can still like play that song and I'm like, oh, like, yeah, I remember, I remember feeling that way, you yeah. know, it brings those emotions back, but in a positive way. So yeah, dude, music's uh music's a crazy thing like that, at least for me. It, you, you open to playing it? Yeah, absolutely. Go dude, for 100%. it. hundred percent. Yeah. Turn my mic off so I don't interrupt what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's cool. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of these songs, like I wrote acoustic. I played acoustic for all these guys. And um, I don't know if I've ever really played these acoustics since, since I cut them in Nashville. So... When we were in love Now things have changed Now that push come for sure Now the crying and the tears And the fear of you Throwing your ring against the wall Yelling at me, telling me how I Take my money, keep the house 
All that shit means nothing now Just reminds me of the memories When I thought this could be Awesome. Sweet. I love yeah. it. I actually listened to the EP again last night at oh, work. Did you? I was sitting there, I was reading. It was a, it was actually, you know, you hate to use the word quiet at work, but it was quiet after the evening. So I, yeah. I picked up a book and put your music on just to, to kind of get back in the frame of mind. Cause I, I listened to it a few times, but I just wanted to be a little more refreshed with it. Right. Right. Yeah. So no, yeah. that's awesome, man. Yeah. I love it. Thanks dude. Uh, all right. So you mentioned that your dad convinces you to take the guitar Yeah. and you mentioned that the therapist says, well, why don't you get back into it and try it out? Yeah. You didn't really know how to play guitar no. when you left. No, I uh, I, I started playing in uh, probably like November of like 2020. And then, yeah, deployment was, shit, I don't know. I feel like I left like April of 21, uh, something like that, somewhere around that time frame, spring of 21. Um, so, yeah, I had played for like a year and like not good. Yeah. Um, no lessons like YouTube and a lot of shit. Yeah. Um, uh, and just watching other guys play guitar and like, oh, I think I can do that, you know, and then not being able to do it for weeks at a time, but figuring it out. So, I mean, learning, learning chords, learning how to strum. I mean, it's, 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 it's all kind of straightforward, but then actually putting it together is so nuanced, yeah. correct? Yeah. And like the, the four chords and the truth type stuff was like all I could do, um, like bar chords, which is kind of a different, uh, way to a little bit more complex way to play certain chords. Uh, you know, that was uh, unheard of to me. And I was like, fuck, I, don't, I have no clue. And uh, yeah, you know, you go on deployment and people are like, oh, play this song. And like, you'll pull up like the, there's an app for anybody out there. There's brand new to guitar called Guitar Tabs. It'll save your life. Um, and uh, yeah, you pull up this guitar tab of this song and it shows you the chords and everything. And you're like, B minor. Like, I don't know how the fuck it B minor. <laughs> and you're like, I think it's like this. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of learning curve to it. But uh yeah, man, it was it was fast paced and just kind of something I fell in love with. And songwriting to like four chords in the truth was uh, the best outlet I ever I ever did. So you start playing for 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 your crew members or or your or the people on bass while uh -huh. you're in Jordan, and it it just become starts to become a natural thing for you. Or how long does it take you to kind of relax into it and go, okay, this is this is something I can do. So like I th the most terrifying time for me ever playing music was the first time. Uh, I feel like anybody ever heard me like playing and singing the guitar. And it was my dad when I was living in his house after the divorce. And I was playing uh, like cover songs. There's a Hardy song called Sober You. And I was playing that. Like my dad started like tearing up. And I don't know. That was like the most like anxious I've ever been. I'm like, man, I just don't want to suck. Yeah. You know? And I don't know if it was like this, the feeling you have. Like, I don't know if it'll ever go away uh, when you have, you know, with your dad where you're just, you don't want to show them parts of you that suck. You know, you want to be like, dad, look what I can do. Right. You know, and it's not like a childish way, but it's just that feeling of like, man, I don't want to fuck this up. And uh, after my dad's reaction and like, you know, seeing my dad support me the way he has, um, you know, it kind of like, you know, I don't really care if I'm bad or not. Like, I, I'm just going to do it and I'm going to preface it with I might I might fuck it up. But, right. You know, uh, I'll get better. And, and I don't know, man, I haven't really been nervous at a show, I think, like ever since then. Um which was kind of wild because I used to like dream about it, like basically just 
feel like I was standing in a room naked in front of people. Yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah it's one of the horrible nightmares, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So how long do you stay in Jordan? Uh, I was there for about seven months, uh, somewhere around that time. Um, and uh, it was like, it's almost like I want to go back. It changed me from like getting over my divorce to when I deployed and then have being surrounded by like all your best friends. Mm -hmm. Right. Like actually my best friend to date is where, I, you know, we really started to link up over in Jordan and, and uh, you know, you just build these relationships that are irreplaceable uh, for me. And, and at the time frame that I was in, I needed that so much. And I have friends, some of my best friends live in Houston, Texas now. So shout out to those guys down there. And, um, you know, it's just, you meet people from all over the world and, and you're just like, you know, irreplaceable friendships that I needed in such a bad time in my life. So it was, it was perfect, man. It was awesome. Yeah. You kind of accidentally build a support system, huh? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And, uh, and it all revolved around music. Um, so, which is wild. So you, is some, sometime during that seven months, someone takes a video of you yeah. and puts it on YouTube. Yeah. Or did you put it on? Uh, and, and so I put it on my TikTok, but the guy, some guy took it for me, who's actually one of my friends in Houston. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I put it on there and it, and it didn't like go crazy viral, but it got like 60 or 70,000 streams. So, you know, enough um, to, to start getting messages. Um, hey, you know, are you interested in, you know, selling the song? You're interested in recording this song? And, uh, you know, I didn't really take it even serious because I didn't know what I had and knew nothing about it. And then this one guy, uh, his name was Dean Miller. He hit me up. And yeah, after, tell me tell me who D Miller is because for some some people might recognize who we're talking about. Yeah, so uh, in Nashville, most people know who Dean Miller is. Um, but uh, you know, I, I knew the name Miller; it sounded familiar. And he's like, "I'm in Nashville, I'm a producer." And I looked him up, and his dad's Roger Miller. And I was like, "Oh, like Roger Miller, like King of the Hill, Roger Miller." You know, he's a really famous country singer from like the '60s '70s era. And uh, he's like, "Yeah, that's my dad." And blah, blah blah. I was like, "Okay," you know. So that one kind of perked my interest. And after doing some research, I was like oh, this dude's like legit. I'm like, what the fuck's he doing talking to me? And so, um, you know, I called my dad and my family was like, hey, like, this is the deal that this guy's offering. Like, what, do, you know, is it something you all think I should do? The guys overseas are like, do it, you need to do it. You of know, course, everyone, yeah. yeah. Everyone's like, do it. And, uh, you know, so my dad's like, yeah, I think you should fucking do it. So uh, I called Dean back and I was like, hey man, like, yeah, you know, I'm down. Let's, let's set it up. So it was like, uh, I left deployment. I was home for like two weeks and then I was in Nashville recording. Um, so I, I felt very out of my element there, but it was a wild experience. Yeah. I think one of the things you talked about was you, you were out of your element because you felt like it's almost like you felt like a fraud because you're yeah. watching these guys have been doing this their whole lives. And, and they're, these are these professionals and here you, you some, and don't take this the wrong way. You're some kid who just learned to play guitar two years ago. Yeah, pretty and, much. Yeah. And you're still learning how to play guitar because you say you watched these guys and they were asking you, well, how do you do this? And and you're like, I don't know. I, I just do it. And, yeah. And so you kind of both learned off of each other a little bit, right? Because yeah. they had to learn what you did. Yeah. So it's hard to say that they learned from me. It was more of a they were confused by me. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it was uh it was wild, man. It it was a very fraudulent feeling, but um you know, I knew what the goal was and, and I knew going into that, like everybody that I'm going to be talking to in this process has, has seen and done this 10 million times. And, and, you know, I'm just some kid doing it. Um, so going into that kind of already having that feeling. And then, uh, as Dean, my producer is introducing me to these musicians, he's like, oh, this is, um, you know, uh, Chad Cromwell, he's played drums with Joe Walsh and, you know, all these other people. And we're like, holy fuck, dude, like this guy's like, where are yeah. we now? He's like, this is Troy Lancaster. He's, you know, a, a lead guitarist, he's played for Blake Shelton. He's been on like 56 number one country songs. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, dude. Like, hi, I'm Charlie Collins, dude. Like, <laughs> nice to meet you, man. I'm a, I'm a firefighter. Yeah, I'm, I'm just some <laughs> podunk fireman, man. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, it was, it was wild, man. And, you know, I'm having a conversation with these guys while they're listening for the first time ever to these little demos that I had made, which is like the equivalent to recording it on my cell phone, I feel like. But, um, you know, we're playing in the background. They're just listening to it. And, and I'm talking to them and then it ends. I'm like, oh, we're going to have to listen to it again. None of us were paying attention. And they're like, no, we're good. We got it. And they just walk in there and just basically what you heard on the album is almost like almost immediately what they just came out with. And right. Like, Holy shit. Like, yeah. You guys are on another level. Yeah. It's crazy, but wild talent. Hey guys, quick break right here just to check in and thank each of you for listening to the show. Your support has been paramount and I appreciate all of you. I have one request though. I need you to share the show with everyone you know 
Help me get the word out and spread these stories as far and as wide as we can. While you're at it, please leave a review of the show wherever you happen to listen. Feel free to reach out to me at any time to share your story, to talk, or to pass on suggestions. Let's get on with the rest of the show. So tell me about Damn Pills. Uh, Damn Pills was a song that I wrote with one of my good friends. He's in Houston, Texas. His name's Kenny Chapman. And uh, yeah, overseas, again, like you meet these people and you form these connections. And the the biggest benefit of, of everything over there is there's no policy. Um, and I say that like all the jurisdictions that we all work in, we have heavy policies. Like mm-hmm. you're allowed to do this, you can't do this, can't say this, whatever. There's none of that over there. You pretty much get left alone to do your job. So with that comes talking to these guys and all the bad shit that you've done in your life, you all get to talk about freely, you know, and there's no like persecution from it. Like, you know, you're all just, you know, talking about your demons and shit and, um, you know, t- talking to Kenny uh, about it and, and, you know, started kind of writing that and we both kind of put in our two cents of things that we've dealt with in the past, you know, uh, you know, bad things, bad shit that's led us to, to where we were. And, and that's kind of what it is. And a lot of it is, you know, for me, like when I was going through uh, my divorce, there was a time at work where my captain sat me down. He's like, look, if you don't call a fucking doctor, like, you know, I'm going to kick your ass. So he like sat in the room in his office and watched me call the doctor. And uh, it was coronavirus time frame, So it was like an on the, on the computer meeting with this doctor later on. And, um, he said, okay, well, you know, do you have an addictive personality? I'm like, yeah, highly addictive personality. He said, all right, cool. We're going to start prescribing you, uh, you know, benzos. And I was like, did you hear what I just said? I, I just told you I have an addictive Massively personality. Addictive. Right. So he's like, well, Prozac's not addictive. I'm like, I know Prozac's not addictive, but the benzo, it wasn't Xanax because we can't be on Xanax for our career. I can't remember what the actual name was, but it was a benzo. And I was like, I just said I have an addictive personality. He's like, well, Prozac's not addictive. I'm like, yeah, but the benzo. He's like, yeah, but that's just like, take it if you need it. I'm like, yeah, okay. Right. You know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it was kind of like one of those things like sat on the shelf, like haunted me. Right. Cause like I'm going through some horrible shit. The Prozac takes, you know, three, four weeks to kick in until mm-hmm. it's not really noticeable. And so you're just dealing with this shit and there, you know, you're like, well, I have this answer on the shelf. You know, it's like sitting there kind of haunting you. But like, I'm like, I can't, I don't want to go down that path. Well, you know, long story short, more or less went down that path. And, um, you know, for somebody who didn't drink really either until my divorce, I didn't have a liquor, like a, a lick of alcohol at all. Um, you know, mixing those two together just became really bad. And like this guy, the, the doctor I had just kept re- just refilling it, man. And it was just kind of went downhill to the point where like, um, you know, like telling my dad, like, and that's part of the, one of the lines and there's telling my dad, like, yeah, no, I'd flush those down the toilet. Like I didn't even know. You know? Right. And it was just a compilation of me and Kenny Chapman talking about these horrible things that we've done in life to like, you know what, let's write a song about it. And we did. And like, we wrote that song and both of us were like, oh, dude, this song fucking kicks ass. So yeah, that's, that's one of my all time favorite songwrites too. But cool. Well, you, yeah, dude, absolutely. Cool. Go for it. Right. Yeah, this is fun. This is, I feel like I'm on deployment again, you know, just an acoustic guitar. I just don't have a fire bit for you. Yeah. <laughs> to sleep at night when the whiskey's the only reason you're alive erasing all the souls I left behind get my mama on the phone she's the only one that'll ever really know all the deep ones I've got buried in my mind oh yeah yeah Saw my ex on the street, she smiled and she waved at me. I hope to God she didn't see all this darkness that's been surrounding me this past few weeks in my new friend Jack, my bag see. I 
How you doing? I'm doing just fine. How's your boy? Well, he's doing all right. Maybe one day we'll spend some more time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Getting my doc on the phone, he's my new best friend. When my pills run low, he writes me a prescription with no end. Lying to my dad about pills, I'm telling him I never even had hell, man. Yeah, ain't that sad? That's crazy. Yeah, it, it's you know I just had that conversation with uh, I don't I don't know if you know Stephanie White. I've heard her name before. She she does the five after midnight. To that. Yeah, I just All listened right. to that with you guys. So you, yeah, you just heard that that conversation about how quickly we are to hand out pills and, yeah. and demonize marijuana or cannabis yeah. or, or even CBD for that matter. And and but it's just so easy to go here. Take this pill. Take this pill. Take this. And it, that's exactly what you experience. It is, man. And like I feel like that conversation of like you know uh, how easy it is to get addicted from scripts like or that conversation's been around. Yeah. But like, what's been done because of that? Yeah, not much. Not, and maybe it's been done to like, you know, normal day in and day out people. But for us, I feel like, I almost feel like people look at us from a doctor perspective. And I'll say this from my, from my experience talking to a doctor, as soon as you tell a doctor you work in fire and rescue, it's just like, you're another level of fucked up immediately. Yeah. Right. Like, they just assume that, oh, you need more than everyone else. Right. Now, I'm not saying that that's not the case because it probably, he's probably not far off. However, that, that the way that I feel like he started talking to me as soon as I said that was like, oh, well, you know, we're really going to treat you. And I don't know if they're trying to do us a solid or not, but it's just, you know, maybe y'all stopped handing out those prescriptions to every, everybody else. But like for us, it's just like, it seems like the go to, dude. Oh, you hurt your back. Here you go. Yeah. You know, oh, oh, yeah, you have problems with sleeping at night. Here you go. Oh, yeah, you're addicted to something. Here you go. And it's just like, well, I don't know. Like, how many times have we heard this story at, at work? A hundred, dude. It's crazy. Well, I think it's, it's, in some ways, it's a dirty little secret at times, though, because I know people, I've, I've seen it and I've heard it of people going, hey, that guy's got a problem. He just asked me about my pills. And yeah. I'm like, wait a second. He's asking you about your pills, yeah. but you're telling, you know, everyone's got these pills, it seems yeah. like. And, I know when I first went and got my, my medical, medical marijuana card, this was, I don't know, whenever it was two, three years ago, actually it's been three years now since I first had it. The yeah. first question I was, my, well, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a firefighter. He goes, I'll say no more. Yeah. He didn't even listen to whatever Which else I awesome. had to say. He just said, you're a firefighter. I know you yeah. need it. Yeah. And just, it's just fucking insane it that is, that assumption is made. Yeah. And, and it is made. And like I said, I'm not saying it, it's necessarily incorrect at, at all the time, but I don't know, man. Sometimes I feel like if you're talking to a therapist or a doctor, it almost it's almost like the opposite of, of, of a feeling that you uh, are used to. Um, like when you're talking to a normal person about something, oh, yeah, I work in the fire department. Most people are like, oh, that's cool. Well, yeah, nice, whatever. Right. You tell a doctor or a therapist, oh, yeah, yeah I work in the fire department. Oh, yeah. How is everything? Right. You're like, well, look, everything's great. You oh, know? oh Not, you're truly fucked up. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm like, now nah, again, like there's definitely times where that's applicable, but, you know, Maybe start out with like, okay, cool. Like, do you like your job? Like, how's it? Like, normal, normalcy, I guess. But yeah, it's definitely like a zero to one hundred at times uh, with therapists and and doctors and and uh, you know with uh, mental health in general, dude. Like, if you're in the fire department and you're you're telling people like, hey, I'm having some problems. Like, that's a thing too. People overshoot on that and like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we need to you know try and get this guy off. Like, you know, he needs to go to the center and whatever. And it's like, 
well, wait, like, you know, I'm, you know, let me just maybe talk this through with at home or people at work or my right. therapist or whatever, before we start shooting a hundred, you know, right. miles an hour. So that, that, I mean, that's big, where crew comes in so much yeah, too. 100%. And, and yeah. Um, you mentioned that your captain forced you to call the doctor. Yeah. And I want to get into Loudoun County a little bit because uh-huh. I think they're one of the most progressive counties in the area when it comes to mental health. And, yeah. And maybe explain, I don't know if you want to explain your your experience with Loudoun County with their mental health or just Loudoun County in general. But yeah. you maybe get into it a little bit of what, but what makes them more progressive. So I think in, what makes Loudoun County more progressive, and and I say this without taking shots at other jurisdictions, is that. When you grow as a department and you start to grow really large, you know, the the people who are in charge of calling the shots start to lose touch with what's going on with shift life. Um, you know, and I don't think that they're choosing that way. It's just they're now surrounded by chiefs and chiefs and chiefs and mm-hmm. chiefs deep. It's like, OK, well, they don't actually know what's going on. So it becomes more difficult for the chiefs who care to actually do something about the people that that are asking these things, right? Most definitely. So with Loudon, uh, I'm not saying that that system is perfect by any means. We definitely have our issues within that exact uh, scenario. However, when it comes to the health aspect, the mental health, we have enough people along the entire line of chain of command that give a shit about that, that have made that a priority. So at all the things that are fucked up in our jurisdiction, which, you know, not saying it's a fucked up jurisdiction, but the things that are messed up, everybody's kind of on the same boat with, trying to make sure that we're more of a proactive versus a reactive community around mental health. And that being said, still, you know, I think being proactive is the best way to do it. Um, and, and I don't have a good answer for it, but the big question is, well, what, what is that? What is proactive? Right. Right. Like, you know, because, um, you know, from a fireman standpoint, it's like, well, proactive would be sending us back to the 2472. And I feel like the schedule is a, a bigger issue with, yeah. with you guys in Fairfax. Yeah. but. You know, proactive, you want to be proactive about mental health. Let's go back to the 2472. You all pay for us to go through this O2X per human performance class, which is a phenomenal program. But then you all don't listen to any of it, you know, and it's like, OK, well, you know, you want to pay for us to go through this program and teach us about how to keep ourselves sane and do the best things to take care of our bodies mentally and physically. But then you're going to fight the class that you just made us take, you know, whether it's simple, small thing. Oh, yeah. You know, don't wear your station boots in the station. It's not good for you or your posture. You know, it, it it could track carcinogens in there and X, Y, and Z, you know, but then it's like, oh, yeah, no, you guys have to wear your station boots in there. It's like, okay, right. that's fine. But just understand that you're contradicting the class you all have yeah. through. So being proactive versus reactive, we're really good being reactive. I'll say that. And I think proactive is the next step, you know. Um, and I'm not really as privy to the uh, the policies that are in the jurisdiction surrounding us. So like how you all treat it, I don't necessarily know. I know that I've talked to a couple of people from Loudon and, and one in particular who did spend time at center of excellence. And it, it seemed like that, that, that move from, okay, you've got something going on. We know you, we need to take care of you to getting you, getting him into the center of excellence to getting him back and then reintegrating him back into, into shift life and, and station life. It just seemed like Loudoun County had it right. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. And I know I know the individual you're talking about. I'm assuming that he's talked about mm-hmm. it on here. Okay. Oh, I don't yeah. want to throw his yeah, name Yeah, no, he's, he's talked about yeah, it. So, yeah, so, you know, Matt's a really good friend of mine. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm glad that his experience was that way because not everybody's experience has gone that way. And it's not to say the center's, like, new, but, like, I feel like the the feel the the freedom feeling of like oh yeah i can go there anytime i want if i had said tomorrow i like, work like hey you know i'm fucked up i need to go to the center for x y and z i don't even really have to say for x y and z and say hey guys like look right. I gotta, you know i gotta do this i can go and i don't have to worry about there being issues Whereas, versus i feel like years past it was like oh shit that's gonna be a problem you know with getting off work and all the logistics that go into that's right. gonna be a massive issue and i know that there's still guys who have problems um i'll, I'll call it reintegrating um, mm-hmm. but you know, I think it's, it's, you know, one step at a time, right? Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna polish everything perfectly the first time. It's going to take some, some repetition. Well, how large are you guys now? What, what's your, what's the size of your department? Dude, now? I think we're probably somewhere in the realm of 800. So um, you're right there with us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I stopped counting track with mine. Uh, we came in, I want to say we were like pushing like 650, 700 somewhere when I came in in 2019. And then I, I'd never, I, I don't know if I've ever even seen a time where Loudoun County hasn't had a recruit class. Right. So it's just constant 
popping people. It's, that's the Northern Virginia way, yeah. really, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, tell me about the song Whiskey. Yeah. So Whiskey, uh, Whiskey is a song I wrote recently. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit less of like a, of like a, you know, this deep, um, deep rooted, like depressing emotions coming through. But it was still one of those things where I was sitting at home. And I had done music for a little while now. I'd played a few shows and, and whatever. And I was just like, man, like, you know, uh, my house is like the size of this. I have a really small house. And, you know, the person that I was talking to uh, at the time, like I was, you know, kind of fighting with them in a sense and whatever, just like bickering minor things. And it got to the point where like, all right, well, you know, she's not going to answer the phone. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, shit, dude, th this sucks. Like, you know, you can have everything, but you just lose those people that you talk to every day. Just that small thing, which isn't really that small, but damn, if you lose whoever it is that you call on a daily, weekly basis, like it gets real quiet when you have nothing else. It's real quiet, real fast. And, uh, you know, those, those things that, uh, you know, have haunted you in the past that I'm not sitting here like I'm on this sober guy. Like I'd love to drink, man. I'll go out on a Friday night and, uh, you know, I'll throw them back, but you know, there's a there's a healthy way to do it and a fun way to do it, and there's a not healthy way to do it. And when it's like a Tuesday at like three in the afternoon, and you're like, "Shit, I got nothing to do. Like, I'm just gonna get hammered." And you're like, "Life of a firefighter." Yeah, unfortunately, exactly, man. And uh, you know, so yeah, it's one of those things where I was like, you know, instead of instead of getting hammered, I'm gonna pick up my guitar and and I'm gonna write a song about this. And so that's kind of where that came from. Um, but yeah, that's been, uh, that's been a killer song for me recently, man. I'm, I'm glad to, to have the feedback I've gotten from that. Yeah. As I say, that's the first one I heard from. Hell so yeah. that's how I got introduced to you. Awesome. So, um, if you're up for it. Yeah, dude, absolutely. Cool. 100%. All right. Yeah. This song's called Whiskey. And, uh, I guess this is going to be more or less the acoustic version. So hopefully I don't fuck this up. And just got off the phone. And I feel like running my head through a wall No one to talk to between these walls Guess that's the price of being a rolling stone It's fine, you can pick up your phone I'll just do in this shit on my own. I'll just drown myself in whiskey. Take the edge off a little bit. Take the edge off a little bit. Oh, yeah. I'll just lose myself in memories. Cause it's all I have for now. Just need to get away Behind these eyes My mind starts to cry And I realize I ain't far behind It's fine You can't pick up your phone I'll just deal with this shit on my own Just got off the phone 
And I feel like running my head through a wall So you 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 talked about your divorce and, and I know that you're still kind of going through some stuff there, but you, you said that it, it was just enough to break. Yeah. Def what do you mean by that? Um, like as far as like the divorce itself, like yeah. just enough to break. Like, uh, again, like a lot of it was just the age range for me personally, like where I was at in life and the lack of experience, the lack of dealing with adversity, you know, the lack of real world problems. Um, and then catastrophically, all of that coming at once, uh, you know, for when when the divorce was decided, when when that was thrown on the table, I was still holding it together. Like I was still like, oh, no, I can fix this, you know. And uh, when that came into play was like just the right amount of I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. So, uh, you know, and when it broke, like the floodgates opened. Um, so like. The divorce got thrown on the table that that was going to happen. And like, you know, uh, I, I mean, I kind of knew it from my parents going through it, but like a divorce isn't quick. Like, no. It takes time. And, and depending on the state, luckily in West Virginia, you don't have to be separated for a year. I know in Virginia you do, but um, either way, it's not a fast process. So, you know, that, that turnaround time of, uh, you know, okay, we're getting divorced to now we're living these separate lives. Right. Um, you know, it was real quick. Um. So like seeing her with somebody else, you know, very, very rapidly, uh, you know, it sucked. And, um, you know, that that's when everything like just started stacking on. I was like, you know, I try, like what else could I have done? You know, like, yeah, I fucked up. Like I did some some dumb shit, you know, but like, fuck, man, like what did I do to deserve this? You know, uh, maybe I did deserve it. And I don't think it was looking back a, a question of whether I did or didn't. It was like, you know. It was the biggest adversity that I needed to face um, to get over all the little the little isms that I had that that were childish and immature. So, yeah, it, it broke. It was just enough to break when that got thrown on, and then uh, after that, it just started piling on. You and and one of the things you said you you didn't understand how to balance it all. Yeah. And and do you think that that balance would have helped you, or do you think that that the divorce was a foregone conclusion just because of everything else? Uh, I think the balance would have helped. Um, but, uh, you know, I think being in the fire department, um, th that's like the biggest, like when, when, when your friends, for those of you, if there is anyone listening to this, who's not a fireman and your friends are telling you about the job and how cool it is, it is, it's the best job in the world. There's no doubt about that. However, the things that they don't sell you on are, you know, how personal this job is for all of us. Right. Um, you can't, you can't do this job as a nine to fiver. Right. Um, and you know, I know I mentioned like when I'm off the clock, I'm off the clock type deal. That was more in direction towards like, you know, I'm off the clock, so it's okay for me to focus on other things now. Mm -hmm. But like, I feel like at our core, we're absolute children. A fire truck drives by and we're all like, oh, what kind of fire truck is that? I'm like, oh, is that a tiller? Why the fuck they have a tiller? Yeah. We're a bunch of whackers. You know, <laughs> like, uh, so you never really like uh, you clean, clean mind of it. So it follows you home. Yeah. Um, and, and not knowing how to balance uh, that you know, as a new person with a new kid and a new marriage and a new place with no friends, uh, nobody told me that, hey, you need to learn how to, you know, take this seriously and make this a part of your life, but not let it consume your life. And, um, you know, again, it was just one of the factors that played into those things where like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. So there's a, you know, what a job we have, man. And uh, it really is one of the best jobs in the world. But, you know, when we sell people on it, you know, through recruit school, it should be brought up like, hey, you know, this, this should be talked about. And, uh, it's not, it's one of those things that's talked about after with your shift amongst yeah. your guys, but like coming into the job, you're not privy to this unless you're a volunteer, unless your dad worked here, yeah. you know, or X, Y, and Z. And I had none of that. Yeah. It's a whole different culture. When you, when you're introduced to it, you, you're, you, you literally learn a different culture. hundred percent. So what do you think you'll do differently now, now, have you learned how to balance this? Because you're 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 yeah. you're you're doing a lot, right? Between yeah. personal yeah. life, music, fire department, whatever, you're doing a lot. So how do you how are you going to balance it? Now? Um, it's one of those things where, like, for me, I'm like trial by fire, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if this is everybody, but like, I have to just start doing it and assess as I go. So, and um, that's what I was kind of talking about when I started taking music on as like a a second, like full time job, if you will you know, there was some overlap where there shouldn't have been overlap. And like, I had to reassess that as I went and said, okay, you know, 
these are my boundaries now, you know, so I'm still successful in both of these aspects of my life. Um, and the same thing with family, with being a dad, with, you know, you know, having somebody else involved in your life and, and, you know, the normal things that we all run through with bills and finances and stuff like, you know, I have to do it. And then I kind of assess as I go. So right now I've kind of got it streamlined. I think, uh, the next test for me will be if one of those things gets thrown out of whack, like how am I going to rebound? Um, so trying to also understand like where I am and, and not fool myself into what I fooled myself in the past being like, I got this, like very easily could not have this. Yeah. I could very easily screw this up. But, uh, you know, just finding that, that balance and, and understanding your limits personally is like the biggest factor, the biggest value that I bring to the table for myself. Do you have an understanding for yourself or, or maybe, maybe understanding is not the word, maybe agreement is more the word. Do you have an agreement with yourself at, at what point you'll go, okay, I can't do both. Yeah. Uh, so I absolutely have an agreement. I have an agreement with myself on multiple, multiple scenarios with that, you know, where, um, if it gets to a point where, you know, I get a, a letter from a chief saying, Hey, you know, for whatever reason, you know, we're not allowing people to have second jobs, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, like I have a son, right. I'll do anything to make sure that he has a good life. Like I will stop music tomorrow if yeah. that's what it takes. All right. That being said, you know, on the same flip side of that coin, if I get to a point where with music, I don't have a boss, it's just me. But realistically, there is a time, you know, if this keeps progressing the way it is where it goes, okay, like I can't, I can't be there. I can't do two places at once, you know? So it, I'm going to have to, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, I want to call it retire, but quit, but leave the fire service as a career. You know, I just won't have time to do it. Right. So yeah, man, I've, I've told myself, like, if I get opportunities that, that, you know, are going to make sure that my son is going to be provided with the things he needs, whatever that opportunity is. And it's something I want to do. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to feel sorry about it. You know, I don't want people to think I'm like, you know, fuck the fire department. Dude, this is like home for me forever. You know, this is, this is the biggest part of my life to date is the fire department and how it's built me. But, um, you know, at the same time, like, what, what I love to do, like what I love to, to see the difference that I make in people is music and like having people come up and be like, oh, dude, that song, or hey, messages on Instagram, I'll oh, do that song. Like I just went through a divorce. Like I have this song on repeat, dude, like you have no idea, you know, how this makes me feel. And I'm like, that's irreplaceable to me. It's the equivalent to, you know, like being a paramedic. I'm not a paramedic, but if you are and you Thank like it. it and you save someone and they come up to you next year and be like, hey, you know. I can't, I can't express what you guys did for me. It's kind of that same feeling, you know, that I get. So let's be honest. It's usually BLS that saves the people. Anyway. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. yeah. The medics are just there just in case. Yeah. <laughs> that you, somebody has to give out the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I know you just got done with these, these tours and I know the month of September was busy, yeah. busy, busy for you. What's the next step for you in music? So, uh, right now we're going to go back to the studio over the winter time, which is a lot easier, uh, scheduling. Um, because of our schedule at work, I have a Kelly week. So, you know, shows, if we're playing shows, it's like gotta be a Friday or Saturday and it's more or less up to the venues. Like, Hey, these are the dates we have open. So, you know, I got to make myself available with ship trades and whatever else. Right. Uh, the winter time and going into the studio is a lot easier. Cause it's like, Hey, you know, is anybody within the guys I record with, Hey, who's off these five days? All right, cool. We got Tuesday. Let's go to Tuesday. And, uh, you know, so it's a lot easier scheduling. So it's a lot more low key through the winter. Um, and just get to kind of go back to songwriting and, and go back to, you know, uh, being a normal person with holidays and, and being right. a dad and Christmas coming up and all that shit. So, um, yeah, it's a lot more low key. And, uh, at the same time, like, you know, the thought is already there for next year for springtime music and summertime music and trying to get tours going and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, you know, it's like behind the scenes work, but it's not as chaotic. Um, cause I'm basically a one man person. Like right. I don't have. I don't have a manager. I don't have uh, a booking agent. Like I do everything myself. And for the most part, I used to tell myself I preferred it that way. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like, you know, it's busy. Maybe I, maybe I made a mistake by turning down some of those offers. Right. So I might revisit some of those, um, offers from, uh, booking agents and stuff. But, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's busy. The winter time's less busy. Uh, it's easier to be a, a dad and easier to be, uh, you know, just a, just a guy, just a person. I don't know, like be what I was before I was running two jobs at once. Do you, do you have songs ready for the next one? Oh yeah. Dude, yeah I, have I figured you did. Yeah. Songs, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's my, uh, I feel like what I bring to the table with the guys that I play with, everybody kind of has like their specialty, like this guy's, you know, crazy on the guitar. 
my drummer's probably I dude, he has to be the best drummer I've ever met. Yeah. Uh he was Aaron Carter's drummer for like seven years. Like the dude's just an absolute animal. Um, you know, and then you know, I don't feel like I come to the table with this like crazy wild voice, but that's songwriting is like my niche. Like I could sit down and write music all day and not have a problem. And I didn't know that that was a that was a specialty of mine until I've you know talked with other artists and they're like, Oh, yeah, I've been working on a song for like weeks. I'm like, You spend weeks on a song? Like, I didn't know what was normal. Right. So I was like, I can sometimes I'll write music like whiskey. I wrote that in like 15 minutes. Like it's just sometimes it just comes to you, you know. And that was that was when I was like, okay, like my niche is songwriting. Like that's my strong suit and I'm gonna stick with that. So I have a lot of music prepared. Um if I had the money, I would, I would do like the Zach Bryan shit and have like a 30 song album. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's well, he's got this uh we yeah. Talk about songwriting. The dude can't stop. No, he can't stop. Right. It's it I love it. I love it so much. But at the same time, you know, we start to get real picky with his stuff. We're just like, ah, oh, this song was okay. It's yeah. Like, the dude has like 70 fucking songs right. out in the last yeah. two years. And dude. he's what, mid twenties? Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. I think he's like twenty six or twenty seven. Right. It's crazy. So uh if you had to pick a song that would encapsulate you. Shit. Um Man, I feel like me is an evolving thing too. So I feel like it evolves with my music. So like the stuff on the EP, I don't know if I would write stuff like that today. So like the stuff that I'm working on now is kind of encapsulates me more of like, you know, like we like to have fun. I like to go out. I like to have fun with my guys and, and uh, you know, um, still talks about some issues that, that I have, but it's way more fun and like upbeat type stuff. Right. So like probably stuff that hasn't been released yet, even though we've cut it. Um but yeah, I mean, we have tons of music. I can I can play new stuff. I can play old stuff. I I tell you what, let's let's dealer's yeah. choice, and you All play right. what you want to play, and then we'll we'll talk a little more. All right. So, uh, yeah, this song is called "Since You've Been Gone," and uh, this is one of our one of our new ones. We're still picking through it, but uh, yeah, I'll play y'all uh, what we've got on it. So. <laughs> Trying like hell to move on A different girl in my phone every night Mama says it's not alright Yeah, I know It ain't my fault I'm only like this when I'm acting strong Only doing shots when I'm feeling alone In this house that you left me in It's so cold I can go back in time Erase those memories from my mind I messed up, I'm a little crossed up right now Don't know if these words are staying in or going out Kill my mind so I can't feel anything inside Known to the pain by now, so it's fine Sending me prayers once again but They don't reach down this hole I'm in that he says He wished that I would have talked to him Might as well call the cops Cause I'm off the deep end Picture of you, yes, what I've been thinking Going insane can get you off of my brain Guess I ain't as strong as I was back then I can go back in time Erase those memories from my mind I messed up, I'm a little crossed up right now Don't know if these words are staying in or going out Kill my mind so I can't feel anything inside Numb to the pain by now, so it's fine Oh yeah Go. So that you're thinking of cutting that on in in the in the fall winter time frame? Yeah. So we've, uh, yeah, man. So yeah, we've uh we've been to the studio last year and we worked on a lot of this stuff and um 
it was just one of those things where when it came time to drop the album, I was like, you know, like we we can do better on some of these. Um, so some of them we've kind of dropped here and there. Um, and uh, the rest of them, I'm like, no, we're going to revisit these. And, and so that's one of them. We've cut it in the past and just things that I did on it um, and things I want to change. I was like, let's revisit it. So that's kind of the updated version of that song. Um, but uh, yeah, man, we've got we got a boatload of stuff coming up. So. You know, hopefully, I'm really hoping springtime uh, we'll have a full album of all new music and, and uh, you know, kind of a, a step towards this sound that we've been kind of changing into, and and uh, hopefully people like it, man. All right, so let's uh, let's transition a little bit into to my last two questions. Yeah, what's an everyday carry for you? And and I mean, I would make some assumptions being a, a musician, but let's see, let's hear what you have to say. What what's an everyday carry? Something you can't leave home and and not feel whole without um man besides my wallet um uh yeah i mean music's music's up there man for one i feel like being a dad uh that's that's probably the one that, that i think about the most like just um and i don't know I, honestly i've never had this conversation with other other dads before but you know uh you leave the house and you're like man like am i doing enough mm. you know um and and a lot of it is like you know you're only for 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 me being a divorced parent and and having this setup that I have uh you know I'm only allowed to to have my son uh, per contract you know two overnights a week and it's like you see him for those two overnights or if he's sick or he was just sick and it's like you know I you know what do you do you know so it's like man am I doing enough like should I should I put all this behind me like what what can I do and you're like kind of sometimes get yourself into a guilt. So my everyday carry isn't isn't necessarily one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, like this is my wholesome attitude, but it's like I leave the house and I'm like, man, like, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm doing all this so that one day, like, you know, my kid can see like you can do anything and, uh, you know, fi literally find what you love and fucking chase after it like a madman and be a savage about it. And, uh, you know, I want him to see that aspect of it, but at the same time, I don't want him to feel like, Oh, you know, like dad's always busy or stuff like this. So that that's my thing is is the mental capacity of like making sure that my priorities are straight, I guess. It's tough, man, because you you, you mentioned being a dad at 19. I was I was a dad at 20. And and it's it's really tough cuz at that young age, you you hold a baby and you're like, "Holy fuck." Yeah, dude. I got to do what? I, yeah. and, and for how long? And and you're learning not just to be a parent from that age, but you're also, you're still learning how to be yourself and yeah. how to be an adult and how to, how to live life as, as you. And so when you, when you're trying to balance all that out, it's overwhelming at times. hundred percent. And, and I guess if, if I was to give any advice, it's like, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fuck up and it's minimizing the effects of those mistakes is the most important thing. And it's like showing, showing your children how to, how to, to, to recover and how to, to forgive, forget, whatever it is, yeah. is the most important thing to, to do for those kids. It's like, this is how you can be a good human. And I know I, f I fell down a few times. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a human being, you yeah. know, we're all human beings. So do, to, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourselves, yourself as a young parent to, to be like the best. Cause you never be the best. Yeah. You just be his dad, you know? Right. And I, I know unsolicited advice and it might be complete, no, complete um, utter nonsense, but that's what there are my two cents at least. So I don't know how talking to you. I never, I feel like as soon as you said, I was like, oh, maybe we did talk about this a little we bit. We did a little past. bit. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, man, like this could have been a whole nother three hour podcast. Oh yeah. How long yeah. Going? I'm like, we can hey. definitely, we can definitely talk more about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, that's crazy. What's, what, do you do much reading? Uh, you know, not really, man. Right. I'm not really a reader. Uh, I, I, things that interest me you know i'll, I'll read tidbits and, and stuff like that sometimes i'll end up in a rabbit hole but as far as picking up a book and going after it not really all right um so instead of a book then t give me um give me give me some give me a couple of artists that, that are on your horizon um i mean my 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 favorite artist right now is a guy named co wetzel who's getting, yeah. getting a lot of popularity so most people know him uh giovanni and the hired guns mm -hmm. if you all haven't heard them um they're badass uh and uh, uh, one of my favorite bands right now is a band called Treaty Oak Revival. Um, so they're, they're, you know, all this Texas-based music is kind of popping off right now. But uh, yeah, dude, they're, they're awesome. Their stories are, are really cool. And their messages, all three of them have, have cool messages. Coe's more of a, 
more of a like I'm gonna throw this glass at the floor and just go fucking party message. But his music's fucking badass. So I saw it in Richmond. I saw Giovanni. In- it opened up for Co. Oh yeah, that's yeah, why I was there too. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. down there. It was, it was a good show. Yeah, and it, dude, that yeah, was badass. Yeah, it was man. awesome. That was, yeah. that was, I, knew, I thought I thought about texting you and seeing if you were there. Oh, I should have. Yeah, yeah. That was a last minute decision for yeah. me too. I had a show the next day. I had one of the biggest shows we had next day, and I was looking at buying tickets, and I was like, "Dude, I can't blow my no. I'll blow my voice out of the Co. concert." And then the tickets dropped like sixty bucks for. The oh pit. really? Yeah, yeah. And I was in the like, pit. It was awesome. Me too. I was like, for pit tickets for sixty dollars. I was like. Oh, it's worth it. Let's do yep. it. And I was like, I'll just, yeah. I'll, I'll just mime the words with my mouth, which felt so <laughs> stupid. But sounds... Dude, it was yeah, incredible concert. Yeah, it was great. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, I'll go see Co. anytime. Yeah. Um. Oh, that's the emergency test. Oh, well, there we go. Well, oh, that's yeah. great time. Man. I forgot about that. Everybody was getting those texts yesterday. Huh. Well, there we go. Everybody got in on the show too. That surprised yeah. the shit out of me. All right. So, what shows do you have coming up anywhere? Uh, we have one show for October doing a Halloween party at this really cool. Uh, you know, a little bar in West Virginia. Um, we played there the first time this year and just kind of like, dude, this is a like really cool, like backwoods, smoky dive bar. It's called Troubadour uh, Lounge. So if anybody's out in the Berkeley Springs area, you know, we'll be out there October 21st for their Halloween party. So uh, I might wear like a unicorn costume or something stupid. I haven't decided yet. I got a couple friends out there in that area. So yeah. hopefully it'll go out and listen. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, all right. You got another song you want to play us out to? Um, sure, dude. I got tons of music, so let me pick this thing up here. I feel like, uh, man, I'll do an acoustic version of this song, uh, or try to do an acoustic version of this song. This song's called, uh, Holding My Breath. This is one that, uh, we just released not too long ago, and I don't know if I've ever really played this on just an acoustic guitar, so we'll give it a shot. I knew how to undo these thoughts tangled in my head See the answer at the bottom of the bottle I keep pushing it till I'm past full throttle Think about when I called you mine The more I think, the more I find Those things don't sit well with me I'm overthinking it and I can't sleep well You have such a beautiful soul So run away from me before I get too deep
Yeah, I like it, man. I Thanks. love that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome, dude. Thank you very much. Dude, I had a blast, man. Thanks for having me out. This and cool. um, I know I'm I'm out of town on the 21st, but get, keep me apprised. I'll, I'll follow your page on Instagram yeah. anyway, so I, I'll see it when you got shows listed. But, yeah, I want to come out and see a show. And, yeah, man, hopefully uh, we might pick up a stray one over the wintertime. But, uh, yeah, springtime, summertime next right. year we'll be we'll be booking up. So Cool, man. Yeah, dude, I appreciate it. Thanks for All having right. me. I Thank you. Right thank on. you very much. All right, we're out. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Things We All Carry. Head over to the website, thethingsweallcarry.com, for show notes, resources, and to sign up for the newsletter. Until next week, take care of yourselves, and remember to check in on each other.